I'm Sam Waterston. You're watching Visionaries, proud to present its 11th season on public television. Visionaries is produced in partnership with the Ash Institute for Democratic Governance and Innovation at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Visionaries was made possible in part by the Exposition Foundation, Incorporated, the Kenneth A. Scott Charitable Trust, a key bank trust, and by Dr. Fred Eshelman. Additional funding has been provided by the following. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news, and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something. That there's something, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. It's all about information. What you don't know can kill you. What you do know, well, a single piece of knowledge can change the world. We are going to tell you two stories that demonstrate the power of knowing. Let's imagine for a moment that you are confronted with a life-threatening illness. Conventional treatments have failed. Where do you turn? Once people in this kind of crisis embarked on an often torturous quest for help. Hours on the phone. Days, if not weeks, in libraries. In a desperate search for new treatments. Now that's all over. Now, thanks to Congress, instant help is a mouse click away. This is the story of clinicaltrials.gov. What are you doing, old friend? Come on, let's go. Discovering that you have cancer is obviously not a pleasant thing to learn, uh, but I was better off than a lot of people discovering that they have cancer because I had spent so much time uh, dealing with the disease and, um, and learning about it. When my sister had melanoma, I was her caretaker. And then about a year later, okay, um, two friends died the same day from breast cancer. If you've been writing for years and years and years that one in eight women in America is likely to have breast cancer, what are the odds that it's not going to be you? They're not all that high. When you look at what's gone before, you've got to be awfully grateful to the people who have participated in the trials that say tamoxifen is now uh, preventative of cancer recurrence. Well, somebody had to discover that, and that required women being willing to participate. To be able to just go into a website and learn these things, that is just wonderful. I did a Google search for clinical trials, and the first site that came up was clinicaltrials.gov. Eyelet transplant, and I'm gonna search for that. After I'd had diabetes for about 35 years, I started to have a very serious complication where I would have very, very low blood sugar and I would lose consciousness. I started to hear about the success of a clinical trial and they had transplanted the islets of Langerham, which are the little tiny beta cells in your pancreas. And those people also had been suffering hypoglycemia unawareness, but after the transplant, they did not. I could get on that website and they listed where they were gonna do the clinical trials. And one of them was gonna be very close to where I live. Everything was right there in front of me from that website. What the eligibility criteria was, what risks, the drugs that I would have to take, everything was all there in one location. And that's what I found so valuable.
Well, National Library of Medicine is the biggest medical library in the world. The basic job of uh, NLM is to acquire, organize, and disseminate the biomedical knowledge of the world for the benefit of the public health. Congress was for some years <clears throat> anxious that, that patients, their constituents, uh, know about what experiments were going on with, uh, particularly in the areas of dangerous and life-threatening diseases. So wh what kind of trials were there and could they get into them? And for some reason the uh, scientific establishment was a bit slow in responding. And ultimately the Congress did what it, it often does under the circumstances, write some legislation. During that, the process, we realized that there were really no patient proactive provisions in the bill, and so the Patient and Consumer Coalition formed so we could talk for the patients, and we met with Congress, and we were able to insert some very good pro proactive patient provisions in the FADAMA bill. One part said um, the director of the FDA, the director of the National Institutes of Health, and the director of NLM shall prepare a, a computer database dealing with the clinical trials and important and serious and life-threatening diseases. And there's no distinction between two different drugs uh, and drugs being studied in combination. Could we collect more data at the input screen? We could sort of let them choose which category their drug goes in. Because there's no way for us to make right. the mapping, we make them make the mapping. Uh, you're right. What has been accomplished is clinicaltrials.gov is an accepted, absolutely necessary part of the information that the FDA needs to provide for patients to be able to access experimental and life-saving drugs when they have no other options. And since this was an intersection of scientific information and the public, in other words, making that scientific information available to the public, the NLM seemed like a logical place to be doing this work. Clinicaltrials.gov is intended to be a comprehensive resource of clinical trials for serious or life-threatening conditions. And the site is, is unique not only because it is uh, as comprehensive as it is and we continue to add more information to it, but I think also because every design decision was based on the fact that we were trying to serve the public. First and foremost, patients, families, and other members of the public. In some cases, the drug name is so recent that what we have is a set of numbers. We have, you know, GSK-123, you know, That's it's... Exactly, you know, it's, right. it's somebody's experimental right, right, drug right. number 123, right, and right. there's nothing else there, and it hasn't been written about. They might make a mistake. I mean, that happens all the time anyway, but... It's a matter of quality control, is that we're trying to make sure that we only put correct and accurate information out there. A clinical trial, after all, is an experiment in human beings. There are many safeguards that are built into how and when a clinical trial is actually carried out. You can see that there is decrease in density throughout the breast. Nonetheless, a clinical trial is an experiment, and there are many risks to clinical trials. There could be benefits to the individual. There will certainly be benefits to society and to medicine and to furthering medical research. Uh, but there may not be a benefit to the, uh, to the patient, him or herself. I've had AIDS for 23 years. I would not be alive if I didn't have access to clinical trials because in the early days, there weren't any drugs. The only drugs that were available were experimental ones in clinical trials. And a lot of people with serious and life-threatening illnesses, they don't have a choice. The choice is to take a chance at a drug that's not thoroughly tested or just, you know, waste away and die. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Koki came in today as a follow-up visit from participation in a clinical trial at the Clinical Center of the NIH. Usually a patient comes to clinic either by referral from their physician, self-referral from hearing about the trial from a friend or an oncologist, or um, from the web. Sometimes it's an intervention trial where we're trying out a new therapy. Sometimes it's a risk assessment trial. Sometimes it's a natural history trial. But we would um, do whatever medical procedures would be indicated, both for the best standard of care and for the research. Get it? Yay. Yeah. I have for many years been an advocate for people getting involved in clinical trials long before I ever was diagnosed with cancer. I have spent some time uh, doing work about clinical trials. Uh, I had done a, a television program about clinical trials um, and I had done a nightline piece about clinical trials. So 
I really felt like I knew a good deal about clinical trials. This is um, uh, from the website from clinicaltrials.gov, which basically outlines the trial. It's close to accrual. The results are already available. But you can go back to here and see how they designed the trial. This is written specifically for pe patients. patients it's, a right. lay, it's a lay person. It's a lay person's okay. one, right? There's also a health professional's one, which I could get if you're interested. <laughs> but this is the lay person's one. That's what the websites are so great for, to uh, be able to read it yourself and be able to make some judgments on your own uh, or with your spouse or with your friends. Uh, that's, that is just fabulous. And that's new. The other important part about the database is that it, it lists all private and public clinical trials, which is a huge issue these days because 80% of all clinical trials are done by private clinical trial organizations. It was essential for me to find out more about the procedure, all that was involved, and it was extremely valuable. You know, I wouldn't have known where to go, who to contact, what the numbers were, without finding all that information in one site. They have now done over 350 worldwide islet transplants. But it is still new, and it's still a clinical trial but it cured me of the only reason I went and partook of the clinical trials. I no longer have hypoglycemia on awareness. So for me, they were very successful. If you typed in any of their names, could you also show? I think that healthcare intersects with information in a very important and very personal way for many people. All of us have family members who have suffered from some kind of a con serious condition. And we have a deep drive, many of us, uh, to get more information so that we can make the best decisions. And in today's healthcare system, we are increasingly being asked to manage our own health care. Have they been looked at to see whether these are good matches or not? We need tools, we need resources in order to help us carry out those activities. And um, how old is this study? The um, study was published in the end of 2003. And, um, but it only took place over a short period of time, didn't it? Right. You come into a doctor's office, I have a half an hour, and I have to cover a lot of material. You really can't remember or digest it all in that period of time. No one can. It's too short. You know, so if they have a website that they can later look at for either additional general information or clinical trial information, it gives a person an opportunity to see things in another way, to hear them in another way, and it helps the understanding. And it's common nowadays for patients to come and say, well, I got this information on the web, you know, what do you think? And it, it helps, it helps all of us. On any given day, we can have anywhere between 13,000 and 16,000 individuals coming to the site. So that's a very large number of people who are coming to the site, using it, exploring it, finding information about uh, clinical trials. <laughs> One of the things that's so important uh, when somebody gets sick, when I got sick, is knowledge. Knowledge is power. And to be able to learn as much as you can learn and then be able to act on it uh, really does make you feel like you are not a victim. And uh, that is why being able to get the information from good sites and then be able to act on it and say, wow, there's this thing that I didn't know anything about, but now I know it. I've got the knowledge. That affects your whole sense of well-being, and I've got to believe that that also affects your actual wellness.